Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. So thankful you're tuning in today, no matter where you find this podcast or on the YouTube channel. We're so grateful for you here at Calvary. This week's episode has none other than Zach Thompson from the Thornton campus, and I can't wait for you to jump into this conversation with us over Nehemiah 10. But before we do that, do me a huge solid, go to calvarybible.com slash your campus and find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. We want you to stay connected or get connected here at Calvary. And that's one of the best and easiest and simplest ways to get connected here at Calvary by going to calvarybible.com. All right, let's jump into the conversation with Zach today. Zach, it's so good to sit down with you today. Yeah. Thanks for being here and thanks for being on the YouTube. Yes. It's a new experience. There's yes. a camera staring at me. <laughs> it's normally just you and me in like a poorly lit room and, yes. and that's my environment. <laughs> hey, I want to apologize and say have my condolences for the Avs losing in the playoffs. I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize that that happened. Uh, oh, was really? that recently? Uh, I don't don't have any memories of that time, <laughs> so clearly sounds made up. <laughs> You have to wait a whole nother year for hockey. Yes. 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 Which is, I mean. So are you bringing this up actually out of condolences or because we lost to a team from Texas from which you, you hail proudly from? Yes. Uh, no, I'm, it's condolences. Good. Cause yeah, there was going to no be, name, name one person on the stars. No clue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and uh, neither do I watch hockey, so I don't know much anymore yeah. about it. That's fair. Many people don't know that you are a huge Avs fan, and those faithful listeners do know, but those maybe tuning in that hockey is your sport. Yes. A choice. Yep, that and soccer, European soccer. But yeah. hockey is 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 pretty high up there. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, sorry about that. Yeah. Another year until another winter. That's right. When we're back on the pond. That's right. We have Zach today. It's so good that he's sitting down with us. Super thankful for giving us your time. You have recently become a father and uh, since the last time we hit record. That's that's also correct. I was going to pause and make it awkward for you, but yeah. I can't pretend otherwise. Yeah, yes. it, it's it's pretty great. We're, yeah. what, eight weeks out? Uh, Six weeks Just out? over seven. Okay. Just over seven. Wow. Yeah. How is fatherhood treating you? I mean, a lot of learning in it. Uh, it's been great. So so glad to have Emily as my partner um, within this as, as we're figuring things out, like <laughs> yeah. sleep and, and things changing. And um, yeah, a big learning for both of them. Emily, one of her favorite things in the world to do is sleep. Mm -hmm. And so it's impactful for, for her to not have as much sleep. One of the things I'm the worst at in life is sleep. Okay. And so when that's negatively impacted, which is already not great, yeah. uh, it's it's been interesting. So if my intonation or content is haywire in this time that is because of my stage of life and the increased levels of coffee that i used to compensate that stage of life yeah 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 Absolutely. I, I got told on a sunday that oh it sounds like you're speaking a little bit faster and it might be because of the five cups of coffee <laughs> or so that i have beforehand it's really fun to see you step into fatherhood and the joy of that yeah what are you hoping for your first Father's Day gift to be? The ability to nap. <laughs> that, that would be invaluable. Yes, 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 it would. That's really good, Zach. I appreciate that, man. That's an honest. And Father's Day naps are the best mm. because you do not feel guilty for them. Uh, that's They're good. A pure gift. That's good. You talked about this week when I was tuning in to the Thornton campus and the preach. This last week was Name Tag Sunday, which yeah. was your first time. Somehow you had avoided it at the Thornton campus for a while. Yeah, so I... On, on our campus, I have a strong view of leadership of uh, do as I say, <laughs> uh, not as I do. Uh, so my ability to, to be anonymous, not wear name tags, not match other people yep. in any capacity is, is, is something that brings me a lot of joy. Yes. And so it was, here's this great idea for us to know the people around us in church. We've had a lot of new people at the yep. Thornton campus. Um, uh, and with being new, it takes a little bit to get connected, to get plugged in. So a great way for us to know who are you sitting next to? Who can you uh, bridge that gap from just having that that basic piece of, I know who, what your name is because it's on you, right. uh, it is, is an idea that, that we came up with a staff, implemented it on uh, the end of January, 
And then I was on vacation in February. The last Sunday in March was Easter, so we didn't do it. And then was out for paternity leave for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so it was great to completely avoid this thing. Uh, that, <laughs> you that made a good run. Yeah. You made yeah, a yeah. really good run at it. Thought about getting sick, but just yeah. couldn't pull it off. Oh, man. That's really funny. It's sort of funny. It shows your personality. It shows I, I can't stand name tags either. It's not because I want to remain anonymous. Is that I'll, if I didn't know your name, I'd just ask you. And so I know people's names. Mm. It's sort of a trick, a gift that I have to have. And so it sort of annoys me that, like, people don't have that gift. You so, know what uh, I mean? Everyone else gets the cheat sheet. Yeah, when totally. you just get to go off of natural giftedness. Yeah, yeah. So I don't like name tag Sunday either. So yeah. For it, a different reason. It's been a gift to us. It, it has been really good, even if I uh, wish I could still be avoiding it. Yeah, totally. So, you know, we are in the book of Nehemiah, and talking about a really important concept of the book of Nehemiah, of renewal of the people of God. And I think that's very striking as uh, a guy who's listened to past Nehemiah preaches on building campaigns. Yeah. And this one is actually really legit looking at the text. When are we going to trick people and let them <laughs> yeah. know this was all so we could build something? But, uh, you know, it's been a beautiful, actually, journey through the book of Nehemiah in a way I wasn't expecting. Mm. As you think about sort of the crest of getting to chapter 10 and going through those nine chapters, some of those probably were in the scope of being a young dad and being sleep deprived. What are some of the things that really stick out to you as you've journeyed up to this point in the book of Nehemiah? Yeah, I I mean... To your point, and to be clear, uh, just in case folks don't know, Nehemiah has this connotation of being rolled out when we need to raise capital gains so we could build something. And so it gets kind of relegated to that position. Right. And so in my mind, it just kind of sticks with uh, they're building the wall. And and that's really important. That's the security of the city. That's uh, people coming back to God's place to live in God's place. And and that's great. But to have this focus uh, that's been coming since chapter 7, where it's so focused on how the people will be faithful in turn. Mm -hmm. All of it is God has brought you back. God has done this work. God's been faithful throughout your history. And now we get from, from chapter seven on of here's how the people will be faithful in turn. And I think that gets summarized really well in this bridge between chapters nine and chapter 10 in, in chapter nine, it's the retelling of Israel's history, retelling of the faithfulness of God. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but it's something like uh, you uh, talking about God. You is uh, shows up like 25 times in wow. chapter nine. So it's just constantly going. You multiplied their children in verse uh, 23. Um, uh, and then you have done that your great goodness they were disobedient against you but you uh, gave them uh, this so it's just constantly going they cried out to you and you heard them all throughout chapter 9 it's you god you have done this you are like this this is your nature this is your faithfulness it's just constantly telling this story how god you have been faithful along the way and then in chapter 10 you get the so here's what we're going to do mm. And you get this list of people who make this covenant together. And as they talk about what the covenant is that they're going to do, starting in verse 28, 10 times, 10 times it's we, Mm -hmm. we will do this. We will not do this. We will do this other thing. We will take this obligation on ourselves. So the second half of the book of Nehemiah is really summarized in this, the shift between, uh, chapter nine, which is so focused on God. Here is who you are. Here is what you've done. And so in response to that of Nehemiah chapter 10, here is what we will do in turn. Interesting. You summed it up uh, really well, I think, in the early part of the preach of talking about a covenant. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we use that word a lot in biblical preaching. Mm-hmm. Um, explain what that word is, because sometimes we don't slow enough down. Most of us understand like HOA covenants. Sure. Maybe like yeah. that type of thing. But what's the really distinction of that word when in relation to God and what God's doing with people? Yeah, and, and especially at this this time that they're in, the covenants were a common thing uh, between kings or nations and, and the like. And, and really just a simple definition that I was 
using was uh, a covenant is a binding promise. So binding is an important word in there. It's not something light. It's not something loose. It's not uh, how we might say we'll do something and, and that drops off. There is no capacity for not keeping your promises. But it's not just keeping a promise. It's a binding promise that intertwines two parties. Mm-hmm. So they are linked going forward on the basis of this promise. So uh, a king will make a covenant with a vassal or vice versa, Mm -hmm. and they are now intertwined. What is a benefit to you benefits me. Mm -hmm. What is good for you is good for me as well. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're going through hardship, I'm going through hardship in that way. So it's this linking together on the basis of the promises that have been made. Super Um, interesting. All throughout the Bible, and this is chapter 9, all throughout the Bible, God has kept his side of the promise. Always. God has been uh, in tremendously and ever faithful that he has kept his side. Uh, and so uh, the people are recognizing they have not. While they are still connected with him, it is this, uh, there is an aspect of discon- uh, disconnection that they've experienced because they have been faithless in response to God's faithfulness. And so it's this promise of this realization of, as we look back, God, you've been there. God, you've been present. God, you've been helping. God, you've been kind and merciful. Even as difficulty uh, comes into our life, you are with us in the midst of that. You, uh, you are faithful to us here. So we, in turn, will uh, be faithful to our side of things and keep this connection that we have, this intertwining that we have, as we will do what we say we will do. So when you talk about the word covenant, a modern sort of view of this intertwining would probably be marriage. You use that yeah. example in your preach, yep. but it's sort of the for the benefit of both parties, mm-hmm. for the detriment of both parties, and it's sort of the idea that we have in our modern world of what a covenant is. Yeah, that's right. And in that example, I really liked uh, a, a example that a pastor that I like uh, in the LA area, Jeremy Treat used for it. He was talking about marriage as a covenant and how it's nonsensical to be inactive in that. So as we read about Nehemiah 10 on the basis of Nehemiah 9, they're saying, we're going to do all these things. Uh, This idea that someone in a covenant does not do their part is unheard of. So uh, used his illustration of uh, imagine someone uh, not participating in the marriage and you you call them out on it. Uh, Like why are, aren't you showing love or support or affection or anything like that? And the response is, well, I made a vow. I made a covenant on our wedding day and I'll let you know if anything changes. Like every day with his actions or her actions, they're letting you know that there's a change because they're not participating in the covenant. Uh, So what we see in this moment of Nehemiah chapter 10 on the basis of all that God's done before is it's saying this isn't a spiritual high. This isn't, uh, man, wasn't it cool when we made that promise? This is a starting point. This right. is saying we are going to do what, uh, we are going to take this obligation on ourselves in verse 32 and says it again uh, in verse 35. We obligate ourselves to do our part of what we promised to do yep. because, God, you have been faithful uh, throughout. So this is not very... Um unfamiliar territory for the people of God because there's some major covenants for biblical knowledge, biblical depth, mm-hmm. understanding. There's some major covenants that we should all be aware of. Like what? Sort of like the Noah covenant. Mm-hmm. So um, that God would not flood the earth like that again. Yep. Um, the Abrahamic covenant. Yep. Yeah, it would right. be another one. What is the divinic covenant? The covenant of David? Yep. You right. chronologically skipped one. Oh, okay. The Mosaic covenant. Oh, the Mosaic yes. covenant. Yep. So from so. the book of Exodus, what God promises to do and, and what the people promise to do in turn, uh, which in Nehemiah chapter 10, they're not creating a new covenant. Yeah. It's looking back as they read through the law and they realize, oh, we're not keeping that. We're not keeping this promise that God made. But as we look, Nehemiah chapter 9, God's been keeping it throughout. Right. And so we are going to go back uh, to what our ancestors said they would do, and we're going to fulfill that piece. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think there's a couple of times throughout our Old Testament that, that, that the people of God do this, right? Mm. Several times. Yep. Sort of gather together, read the law. They divinely renew their vows. Divinely renew, yeah, yeah renewal vows. They don't vows. go to Hawaii to do it, though. They just kind of do it back in the land. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's super interesting that we can now see that. And, like, th- it feels like this covenant, though, as you were preaching on it, felt very conditional. Mm. Does that make sense? It had a very conditional tone because we know the story that they failed to live up to this. Mm-hmm. 
and um, that's why we need Jesus to bring in the new covenant. So how does that correspond with your understanding of covenant? If it's intertwining for both parties, sure. it seems like it's conditional. So uh, it, remember, it's a binding promise. So we will do this piece. So we are intertwined as we do this piece. Right. We are in a marriage as we each fulfill the part of the, the promise that we make in the marriage. When someone says, uh, I'll let you know if anything changes in my vow, they are not keeping their part of the covenant. So that is a breaking that is a fracturing of the promise. Right. Um, even think of, and Thomas emphasized this really well on the Erie campus uh, last week. Tom did it the, the week before uh, of kind of this, this summarized uh, verse of uh, chapter nine. Um, I believe it's in chapter nine of uh, you have been faithful uh, and we have not. And I can't find it immediately in front of me right now. Um, you are gracious, merciful, slow to anger, bounding steadfast love. You did not forsake them despite all that's going on. You have been faithful and we have not. So you're talking about conditional. Conditional, uh, just to be really simple, is an if-then statement. Right. So if you do something, then this will be the result. So that's a condition. Uh, God uh, called his people to live faithfully in return because he was faithful to them. Uh, they did not. And so there's uh, punishment that goes into, they go into the exile. None of that is, you have no hope, you can never be back again. But this is actually, uh, this is where the condition breaks just a little bit. Uh, it's God never gives up on his people, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, any good king is going to care for his nation. If you break your side of it, then you are done. There, there's no more to it. But as the people go in exile and as they acknowledge in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, even as we went away, you heard us. You heard us as we called back. And so God called his people to return. Yeah. Where we see this change a little bit more is in a new covenant, uh, which Jeremiah talks about, uh, which is uh, that, that God will create a new covenant with his people, that he will renew their hearts, write his law uh, on their hearts, which is entirely focused on the language that God is going to do. Mm. So uh, what we see and, and where we move a little bit from the covenant that uh, the Israelites make in Nehemiah chapter 10 to where we are is there, there's not a side for us to keep. Right. Uh, this is what are the conditions of the covenant? They're paid in, for, uh, paid in full by the blood of Jesus, that he has kept both sides of it. He completes both sides of exactly it. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so there still is an aspect to it to where we respond with faithfulness, mm -hmm. but not as a... Uh, not as this picture of, uh, well, I'll let you know if anything changes with my vow. This is when we see how overwhelming it is of what Jesus has done for us. When we see how incredible the love of God is, well, th there's nothing more propulsive to be driven towards God than the fact that he has kept both sides of the covenant. Yeah. Motivation, we, we come from love, out of love. That's right. Out of uh, those things more than motivation out of duty. Mm -hmm. in the new covenant. So, you know, we talked about, which I think is really fascinating, these covenants and the new covenant and the completion. I'm really thankful you went there with Jesus Christ. It seemed like as you, as the preacher, you have to apply the text to the listener of today. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated how you subtly did that through sort of how you talked about the people of God did it. In this, in chapter ten, where they use um, how they change how they use their time, mm -hmm. how they change how they use their money, mm -hmm. how they change the worship. Did I miss one? I ended on unity as well, but those unity. were the three that I, yeah. that I focused on. You know, let's speak to that because I think that really applies to our lives today under the new covenant too, as well. And it's sort of like a kingdom ethic, if that makes sense. And that's a big word. Yeah, we're talking about the new kingdom of Jesus Christ and sort of the ethic of how we should live mm -hmm. in response of this covenant that he completed both sides of. And we're looking at Nehemiah and their renewal of their covenant with God and how they should live, yeah. which have really great parallels. So how did the people of God then in Nehemiah use their time in this new new renewal of covenant with God. Yeah. Uh, let me just back up really fast because I, I want to be over the top in enunciating this. Yeah. Uh, all of this comes because God has been faithful first. Right. So we live lives of faithfulness in response. None of this right. is earned. None of this is uh, duty or obligation. God has been faithful 
in response to that, we live faithfully. Now, what starts to happen is when we live as God calls us to, we live lives that look distinct. Yeah. Uh, there's a physical act of that in Nehemiah chapter 10. The people separated themselves right. from uh, those who were non-Israelites. But then everything that they promised to do in this covenant separates them further. Their actions make them distinct from those around them. I, I think of Jesus' words. He says that you are salt, you are light, that in living as he calls us to live, that that is distinct, that's noticeable right. by others. It's a change from how others who do not know Jesus would live. Right. One of the ways, as you were talking, that the Israelites did this in Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, they say in verse 31 that we're going to keep the Sabbath. Yeah. One day a week, we will not work, which at the time, uh, your food came from your work. Uh, if you did not work on a day, you didn't eat. Right. And so it's this act of saying we trust in our God more than we trust in our labor. And that's distinct from the nations around them. A little bit different from our lives, we have a weekend uh, where we get time to separate from work. Now, certainly some people have jobs where even on weekends they work, and so it would still be distinct to take time to not work in those times. Yeah. But just think of that idea of how do we use those times mm. off? Uh, how do we use our time? I mean, some parts are set. Uh, many people are working or, or finding jobs or caring for people and their family. There, there are some expectations and responsibilities that are set in our week. But our weekend tends to be a time for people, whether that's a traditional weekend or whatever it might be, that tends to be a time that's our time. Right. What does that start to look like? Right. As we look in our cultures, I'm sure Erie is similar to Thornton, which is similar to Boulder, at least in an overall sense of that's a time that tends to get filled up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, that's where there's parties and practices and games and activities and planning for the week and shopping and, and all these things mm -hmm. that are good. They're, they're all good things to be doing, but are we just using our time to be full of things uh, in a way that looks like our neighbor rather than seeing this principle that was given to the Israelites of taking time to pause, to use this as a moment to trust to grow closer to God, to worship him, uh, to use this in a distinct way rather than just going or going or going and going. And my observation, uh, at least in my own life and and people close to me, is our weekends get full of stuff. Right. And there's times to pause, to reflect, to, to be noticeably distinct in how we use our time is overshadowed. And we lose this distinction in a place that God calls his people to be distinct. Yeah, and... That's sort of a great segue to how we do this. Even this summer, as we have opportunity maybe to rest a little more, mm -hmm. there's some summer holidays, there's things like that, to really pause and reflect, pray, rest, sh declare to the world yeah. that we are different because we trust in a living God who will provide. That's right. And doesn't our saying yes to something doesn't define who we are necessarily by going to a sporting event or picking up a new club sport or whatever it is mm -hmm. that we all are guilty of and have obligations in our life to like really be intentional how we live and use our time. Yeah. The idea isn't to over, uh, overcorrect on this and cut everything out. Uh, I will yeah. never see my, my non immediate family again. There's no such thing as right. friends on weekend. We are just going to sit at home and think about God the whole time. Like that's, that's of course not, not the call of this, but it's to remember who is our greatest commitment. Mm -hmm. Our weekends get full of a lot of commitments, mm -hmm. but what is our greatest commitment? And as that shapes our time, that's something that becomes distinct. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges that, that, I have in this is like not only what is my commitment, but if I purchase something, what am I committing to having someone else do for me? Mm. So like delivery of Amazon trucks on Sunday, you know what I mean? Like, am I really participating in the economics of the world that says 24 or seven mm. or am I pausing and intentionally saying I can wait till Monday to get that thing that I want mm. so that I forcibly she can show and, a small impact of like how I'm choosing to use my time and ask others to, does sure. that make sense? Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Cause we talk about Sabbath and I think this is one of the hardest concepts for Americans to understand. Yeah. And especially I, I didn't get fully into it right now. And, uh, 
what's great about the power of editing is this could get cut out if it's deemed as inappropriate. But uh, where we see this a lot is with our kids, right. where it becomes so easy to go into well, uh, it's gymnastics, and this is their outlet. We're going to pour everything into gymnastics, but it's also t-ball. Right. Uh, so we're going to pour everything into t-ball, uh, but it's also soccer or um, archery or uh, arts or w- right. whatever it might be. That it's it's just really easy to spiral out of control. And the heart behind that is so good. Right. Who wants to deny their kids anything? Uh, and so it's it's helping to give them this well-rounded experience uh, as they're growing up to get this experience to see what is their genuine interest in it. And so it's a good heart behind it, but a lot of good things can take us away from what is our ultimate thing in, in God. And it can quickly spiral into our time is just scheduled to death. Yeah. Um, and what happens is, is we miss the distinction as, as what's called here, but it kind of, we're starting to see some of the other side of some of the, the, the research is coming out that this, constant scheduling this constant being part of of all these different things is revealing itself in breakdown when students get to college so much of it is this pressure this full schedule of keep doing stuff keep going keep going do the best in all things you could be who what uh, you want to be just keep working at it and that that we're seeing these college students have breakdown moments because they've just had their life so fully scheduled Mm -hmm that it's it's leading to difficulty and, and being able to assess this and and it's ending in disastrous results. Right. Uh, not to say that if you cut back on things that that fixes any any of this, but it, it just points that that proof of if we just continue to go, if we just continue to just add things and add things rather than these moments to pause mm-hmm. and trust in God. Like, like we we put our kids into all these activities because man, what if they become a baseball star? Or what if this extra class is going to uh, get them a great job in STEM or, or whatever it might be. And those are good things to be thinking through, but it's just all these what ifs. And I don't want to deny my children, uh, my children, anything uh, that, that gets to the point that we're not pausing. Like we need to pause We're we're not reflecting on who our God is. We aren't trusting our child's future into the God who has control of all things. It's just one more, one more, one more. And, and it, it's not how we're made to live uh, as humans, let alone as we try to use time in a distinct way. Oh, I, I totally agree, Zach. Chris and I were just even talking about this weekend because we're sort of in that stage of life where to go on into like some of the fun things the kids want to do, there's a sort of step up into clubs and other obligations that we are unwilling to do right at this point. Mm-hmm. But she made a great point. Like, what does it teach our kids that – they become the center of our schedule mm. instead of God becoming the center of our schedule. Yeah. And sort of how the participation trophy era is over, you know, like it really didn't help a society grow up knowing that they everyone got a trophy, mm. that there's winners and losers. That's a really good formation of the human journey. In the same way, what are we teaching our kids that their their schedule of their formation is more important and the more priority than like the marriage of the parents or the the center of their universe of worship on mm-hmm. Sunday mornings, you know? What is what are sort of the, the shrapnel of these decisions um in our society that we're really wrestling through as a couple? Yeah. And we see back in Nehemiah jumping back, we're committed to God because God has been committed to us. Yep. Therefore, let us leave, live distinctively knowing that our schedules actually are God's schedules and his agenda is our agenda. And then that should actually sort of transpose over the world in which we live. That's right. And then yeah. become salt and light like you're talking about. Yeah, and and said it before, but want to emphasize uh, because most reactions are overreactions. Right. Not saying cut everything out of your weekend. Right. That's not what it, what it is at all. Um I really appreciate Jen Wilkinson's teaching on this point. Uh, she sat at, at a church in Texas area and, and works a lot with families and women's ministry. She uh, talks about her, their family did a, a one or none where um, you can have one or no outside activities. And if you have the one, we're going to invest fully into that, uh, but it's not going to spiral into all these other things. Right. 
So it's not uh, get rid of all extra things, uh, get rid of every commitment in your life. It's just that reminder of what are we ultimately committed to. And that's a great question. No matter what season of life you're in, retirement, young adult, family, middle life, what are you? What is your life committed to? Mm-hmm. And we've all got to pause, pray, and center ourselves back again to the ultimate reality that God is God. That's right. And our response to that. That's right. And a decisions decisions are going to have to be made. Yeses and nos are going to have to come along with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you talk about, um, I would like to talk about sort of this worship because we... We sit in the New Testament reality and really don't understand sort of temple worship. Mm-hmm. It's very strange to us. There's no chairs there. It's not a formal gathering in the sense of, you know, you come to church, get coffee, donut, sit down, enjoy a, a service, sing some songs, stand, pray, sit, read the Word of God. It's a very unique culture in which we don't understand. Yeah. So how does how are the people of God different than their time period of that? Yeah, I, I think I'm tracking with you. Uh, hold me accountable if I'm if I'm not answering what your question is. So uh, in Nehemiah chapter ten, we have the the people here uh, participants in the work of God. It says uh, that uh, we will not neglect the house of our God yeah. um, in there, and that they are part of the work of God. This includes gathering animals for sacrifice, for wood, for paying some uh, uh, some money to those who run the temple and for the care of the temple. It's not to build the place, but right. to do the work that's being done. And a lot of that work is this the sacrificial system to where they confessed all their, their sins in the previous chapter, and it's this, we know that we're not going to perfectly keep our side of the covenant. Right. It is through the sacrifice of animals that we make up that difference. We don't have that in the New Testament because Jesus has once and for all uh, fulfilled the obligations and the shortcomings that we have. Um, Book of Hebrews speaks about this quite a bit. Um, So the the work of the the house of God in Nehemiah chapter 10 is this sacrificial system, is this uh, absolving aspect, is this worship of God in light of brokenness Mm -hmm. turning to his ever faithfulness. And what the people are doing by being part of their worship, distinct in their worship, is they are joining in that act, joining in that work, part of the service of the house of God. And that looks distinct. They're giving up financial resources to do this, but also giving up time and energy and effort to be participatory in to, to participate in the work that God is doing in his place. They have to make sacrifices. Someone yep. has to provide the wood yep. for the altar to be turned on. Mm-hmm. There's got to be bread in the temple for the priests and for the sacrifices. And exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's just a very unique... I just don't think I can get my head around sort of what that looks like. You know what I mean? But Nehemiah 10 tells us that these people participate in it, make a covenant to come back into yeah. making sure it's established. I mean, there's similarity in terms of there's a lot of places for us to be part of the work of God. Yeah. Um, that there there's a, a vast array of places within the church or outside the church to be uh, participants with the work that God is that's doing. That's a good point. I like that point. And that's what we see the Israelites doing here. They are part of the work. They is not just the financial side of things, but they're actively part of the worship uh, of God, uh, actively part of the work that he's doing. And we see people do that in kids ministry and student ministry and uh, making coffee and greeting folks or leading life groups. There's a variety of places where people are using their worship, using their everything to direct towards God. And think about how distinct that is to uh, how often is our tendency of we had a long week, we are broken, we're beaten down, short on right. energy, and we show up at 7 a.m. for worship team practice. Or uh, we're here on a day that we had to sleep in to invest in the lives of kids. Right. Or uh, we have just enough time to scarf down food after work to be part of student ministries at night. Uh, that is distinct. Uh, yeah. Why would you deny yourself resources? Why would you deny yourself time to do something that doesn't directly benefit you? Mm-hmm. Well, it's that we are participants within the work of God in the place of God, and that is distinct. Oh, man, Zach, I love that. And we need to, I think, at the end of the podcast, really remember 
who's sitting on the throne, who's in charge, and how we can participate, each of us, in sacrifice towards, yeah. Yeah. Just the keeping of the work. Always remember the order, though. You, 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 in chapter 9, you have been faithful. This is who you are. This is what you've done. Therefore, chapter 10, we will do this. We obligate ourselves. We live lives of response, not earning. And when we see the love and faithfulness of God, that is the greatest motivator to return in faithfulness, to live these distinct lives because we see who our God is and what he's done. Well, thanks so much, Zach, for that encouragement to us. Thanks for being here today. Calvary, we're so grateful that you're tuning in once again to the weekly. If you always have a question, leave them in the comments on the YouTube channel. We read those. We would love to respond to those. Also, let me end today with our hearts being turned back to God. No matter where you find yourself as this podcast is released into the world today, let us remember Psalm 100. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us remember to make that joyful noise today together the people of calvary the people of god and know that we continue to pray for you we continue to uh, stay faithful because god is faithful to us and he is the great shepherd of our souls and we're so grateful for you listening in and we will look forward to once again turning this back on hit and record and having another wonderful conversation here at calvary with you